Number 10, Hank Pym's secret daughter. Nadia Van Dyne is Hank's daughter who we didn't know existed until 2016. She was introduced in a free comic book day issue about Civil War II. Now of course I like Nadia Van Dyne as a character, don't get me wrong, but her being added in retroactively as Hank's lost daughter was something that I felt like was a bit much. When we learned of Nadia's backstory, we learned that she was the daughter of Hank Pym and his first wife, Maria Travoya. Maria was kidnapped during her and Hank's honeymoon and killed. Nadia ended up being raised in Russia, trained in the Red Room. Eventually she escaped after learning of who her parents really were. By the time she got back to America though to see her father, Nadia learned of his sacrifice to save the world from Ultron and his death as a result. She decided to seek out her stepmother Janet Van Dyne and became close enough to her that she felt compelled to change her own last name to Van Dyne. Cause that's not confusing at all. She's Hank's daughter, she's not at all related to Janet and yet she has her last name. Number 9 Falcon's X Gene. Remember that time Falcon was revealed to be a mutant and then we explained that origin away with, you know, a faulty sentinel? If you don't, let me explain. In issue 174 of Captain America, we see Professor X meeting Falcon and Cap. Charles implied Falcon's connection to his birds seemed telepathic, and that Falcon's telepathic abilities may be mutant in origin. Falcon himself took this suggestion to heart and even considered what it might mean for him to be a mutant, pondering on his strong, seemingly psychic link to his bird Red Wing. He then encountered a sentinel who identified him as a mutant, and so he was a mutant for a time. This was established. And this wouldn't really be revisited or retouched till 2001. One, where the idea of Falcon being a mutant was tossed in the trash and explained away as a sentinel simply malfunctioning. Wah, wah, wah. Number 8. Black Widow's Confusing Backstory Natasha being a mysterious spy from Russia who switched sides means that yes, we are going to get a complex backstory for her, but it actually wasn't always that complex. Natasha was inspired to fight for her nation originally when her husband was assumed dead in combat. Her husband wasn't really dead of course and it was implied that this was all part of a plot to basically encourage her to fight for her country. Before that, Natasha was a renowned ballerina. Later on however, this whole origin was revealed to be a lie when we learned that the Red Room had embedded memories of her being a ballerina in her mind. They made her think she had trained in ballet, but she hadn't really, because I guess that's what the Red Room does, they mess with you and give you fake memories. Her story was also changed from a woman who was inspired by her husband's sacrifice to put her own life on the line for her country as well, to that of a woman being blackmailed and threatened into becoming a spy in order to protect her husband. Number 7. Professor X Married Mystique Some retcons that are really strange come from film inspiration. As a lot of people discussed in the comments, many feel that Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver for example would still be mutants today if it wasn't for their being introduced in the MCU's Avengers franchise, which didn't have the rights to include mutants, so we had to kind of unmutant them. I feel as though the case was possibly similar for this weird secret retcon. In 2013's Uncanny X-Men issue 24, we learned of Mystique and Charles Xavier Xavier's secret marriage, meaning that the child we saw Mystique gave birth to while in the guise of Moira McTaggart was likely one willfully conceived as opposed to Mystique tricking Charles into sleeping with her, which would have been super weird and pretty pretty not good in my opinion. In the X-Men prequel films such as First Class which came out in 2011, we see a different kind of relationship between Raven and Charles. We get this weird love triangle between Charles, Raven, and Eric. And it seems more of that likely influenced this weird retcon plot point revealed in the comics in Charles' will. Number 6. Kills off the last humans During Marvel's The End, Marvel shared with us what various characters would do when faced with the events of and aftermath of the apocalypse. The Punisher was able to track down the last surviving humans who also happened to be a bunch of jerks who were basically responsible for the events of World War 3, which had resulted in this apocalyptic scenario and world that we found ourselves in. They offered the Punisher a choice. He could let them live and they would work to restart the planet and human race using genetic samples, or he could kill them for what they'd done, but you know, then humanity he would die with them. Being the Punisher, he decided of course to kill them. Though I gotta say, it definitely sounds like they deserved that, but still, he just like condemned humanity for forever. Now we're gonna be extinct. Number 5. Serves Thanos If you don't know Cosmic Ghost Rider, I highly recommend checking him out. He's an alternate version of Frank Castle that agreed to become a spirit of vengeance and thereby Ghost Rider. As such, he survives basically the death of all of planet Earth when Thanos comes to raise it in his destruction of the universe, and eventually when everyone else who would stand up against Thanos in the cosmos has been defeated, 
joins Thanos. He does at least try to stand up to Thanos in the beginning, but in the end kind of goes insane and then sees serving Thanos as really his only option, especially if he doesn't want to be alone because you know it's hard to live forever and be alone forever. It's really sad. CGR helps Thanos to destroy what is left of the universe and remains loyal to the mad titan Thanos even when an opponent looms who could actually stand a chance at defeating him. Known as the Fallen One, formerly the Silver Surfer, who now also wields the power of Mjolnir. Number 4. Raised Thanos or at least he attempted to anyways. This heinous act, which doesn't inherently sound too heinous truth be told, came to us from the alternate reality that Cosmic Ghost Rider belongs to. Later on in CGR's story, he is granted the opportunity to travel to any time and place that he would like via Odin. This twisted version of Frank chooses to travel back to the moment when Thanos was born. CGR attempts to use his pen and stare on the young baby, who it doesn't work on because you know baby Thanos is still at this point innocent and is yet to become corrupted. Although I gotta be honest, does the pen and stare really ever work for Ghost Riders? I feel like I see it fail more times than it works in comics. CGR instead of killing baby Thanos decides then to raise baby Thanos himself, hoping to alter the future by teaching Thanos to be good. He later runs into the future version of that baby Thanos all grown up and learns that raising Thanos led to an even worse alternate future for Earth, where people are imprisoned by this Punisher Thanos, kept in camps, and killed if they choose to step out of line when it comes to Thanos' plan for enforced peace on Earth. Basically, without meaning to, Frank actually created an alternate reality where living on Earth is kind of like living in hell. Number 3. Executions While it might not be as bad as condemning Earth to the fate of his adopted son, Punisher Thanos, I personally find this gruesome depiction of the character even worse. This take on the Punisher and his actions comes to us from the 2005 Punisher video game. Here you gotta play as Frank Castle beating up targets to secure key information, key information, before executing them. The adults only rated game was described as having over a hundred unique executions for fans to choose from. <laughs> Wow. The fact that many of these were also super brutal and torturous ways to die only made all of the Punisher's actions here, which you as the player were in control of, even worse. Talk about a glorification of violence. Number 2. Kills the Marvel Universe In the story Punisher Kills the Marvel Universe, we get a front row seat to watching Frank Castle eliminate literally pretty much every hero, villain, and just about anyone else who gets in his way, as he makes quick work of the entire Marvel verse. As awful as this is, it's also really impressive that Frank, who is admittedly just a human, is able to take out all these super powered beings so successfully and often efficiently. In the end, after Punisher has eliminated just about everyone there is, one person is left for him to take down, for it to be considered a completely clean sweep himself. And Frank doesn't even hesitate. Now what caused all this chaos by the way? Like in many other Punisher stories, it was the death of his family, which in this reality appeared to have happened while they were caught in the crossfire of a superhuman battle. Number 1. Excuses One of the worst things about the Punisher is that he tries to make you feel like his actions are justified by using the loss of his family as an excuse. And oftentimes that also works for us readers. Now I'm not saying that what happened to Frank Castle's family wasn't terrible, because it was. But ultimately what the Punisher represents is this obsession with violence and the feeling of a never ending war. Jason Aaron in his Punisher run attempted to reveal the veiled truth behind Frank's excuses for continuing this never ending battle, which honestly Frank himself is likely not even aware of. When he proposed a story with Frank Castle contemplating divorce moments before his family is killed and also returning home and basically questioning if he actually enjoys life or if he would rather just kill people. Number 10. Jean Grey was resting the whole time After Jean Grey died as part of the Phoenix Saga, everyone was left flabbergasted. During the story, we'd seen Jean merge with the Phoenix Force, become insanely powerful, lose control over this power, become corrupted and dark, basically become a huge supervillain, and finally sacrifice herself knowing that if she didn't, it would only end badly. Or worse than badly, because it was already pretty bad. Jean Grey, one of the original X-Men team, was dead or so it seemed. Later on, Marvel would want to revive the original X-Men team and bring them together on a new team and comic series called X-Factor. So Jean needed to come back to life, but hey, she was dead. So we got the added story to explain that the version of Jean that had died wasn't really her, but was a separate entity known as Phoenix. Sort of this merged thing wasn't really Jean. Jean herself was resting comfortably in a pod beneath the ocean, still lived and would be able to return. Yay. 
Number 9. Tony Stark was adopted. Yep, that's a thing that happened. I'm just wondering if this one will show up in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I can't deny that if we get an Arno as a result, an Arno Stark, I would actually not be too upset with that. <laughs> Even though this retcon's pretty weird. The reason this retcon was such a terrible retcon for Tony was that his parents and their loss always remained a great catalyst and huge emotional plot point for him. Now, of course, just because he was adopted doesn't mean that he can't still love his parents as much as he did. And and still be as emotionally affected by their death. That's not what I'm saying. But his parents also had a naturally born son that they hid from Tony, who was born before they adopted Tony, and he also didn't know that he was even adopted. Also, there were aliens and alien tech involved in Arno's birth, which explains why this all had to be a secret, but also just, it's just a lot. All in all, this revelation greatly changed the way Tony saw his parents and made their relationship more complex. And I don't know if either of those things needed to happen. Number 8. Hail Hydra One of the most shocking moments in Marvel's comic history was when it was revealed that Captain America was actually a sleeper agent for Hydra the whole time. Say what? The guy who for years was diametrically opposed to Hydra and all their beliefs, who had tried and succeeded to foil their plots countless times, was a Hydra agent? How could this be? Well, apparently all those wins were a part of his doing a very good job to convince us all and trust him so that he could stab us in the back at the right moment and take over America, becoming Hydra Supreme. Fortunately, this evil version of Captain America would later be revealed to have been created by Kobik, a living sentient version of the Cosmic Cube who was manipulated into making this retcon happen. What's more, the true Captain America still existed within the shards of the Cosmic Cube and would return once more to defeat his evil self, fixing the timeline. So I mean, at least this retcon ended up not staying permanent, but still, it's pretty weird. Number 7. Zorn Okay, so I was actually going to make the title of this point a little more explanatory, but then I realized how long that would actually make the title of this point. Okay, so Zorn was basically a character who showed up in the comics who was a mutant who always needed to wear a mask. Because of this, we never saw Zorn's face, leading many to wonder who is really under the mask. Although I think most people just thought, well, it's probably a new mutant, because you know, we get new mutants added to the comics every day. But no, of course, this is comics, so it had to be some one. In a dramatic twist, it was Magneto. But no, of course, this is comics, so it had to be someone that we already knew. In a dramatic twist, it was revealed to be Magneto, who had infiltrated Xavier's school in order to rally up mutant support and help him create an army. He then destroyed New York, shot Emma Frost, killed Jean, and was eventually killed by Wolverine. Later on, however, Magneto would turn up again because, well, he's Magneto, and writers wanted to inch him closer to that line between villain and anti hero again. Again. So they basically retconned Magneto's involvement in all of this. It turns out there was a real Zorn, and it was actually Zorn's brother impersonating Zorn, impersonating Magneto, who was really to blame. Wow. Just wow. Number 6. Thanos. Number 1 Dad? Thanos has never really been known as a caring and kind person. Even the people he keeps close to him are never really fully safe from his wrath. Faithful servants, family members, to Thanos, everyone is pretty much disposable. The same could be said for his adopted daughter Gamora, who he hardened and transformed into a killer until she ended up later rebelling. In the 2019 Thanos series, however, we learn how Gamora's relationship with her father was, well, more complex. How he actually, in his own way, was kind of a good father to her. This series also highlights how much they both cared for each other, despite the fact that an Infinity Gauntlet, which happened in the 90s, pre this series, but in terms of continuity would have taken place after this, Thanos seems to not show any regard for his adopted daughter's life. So it's kind of a retcon, doesn't make a lot of sense. Number 5. Spider-Man's Non-Sister So this is kind of another retcon that for me is similar to Nadia's. I like the idea of this character, but the whole story involving her is... Well, it's pretty wacky. Teresa showed up in Amazing Spider-Man Family Business claiming to be Teresa Parker, Peter's sister. She believed she was the daughter of Richard and Mary Parker, Peter's parents, and we got a few cool adventures with her assuming this belief to be true. She was retconned into existence, but honestly, I thought she was kind of a cool retcon to add in, so I was cool with that. However, things got weirder when we learned that the secret sister we'd never heard of till now was all a lie, and that Teresa actually wasn't who she said she was. Despite what she herself 
had been manipulated to believe. It was all a trick and Mentalo had manipulated Teresa into believing it herself. It was all part of Kingpin's plan to basically lure Peter to a tomb. And we don't actually even know who Teresa's parents are now. Still a mystery. They even manipulated how Peter saw Teresa, making her appear more like him. So she'd look more like his sister? <sighs> it's weird. I wish she was actually his sister. That would have been cooler, I think. Number four, Spider Destiny. Now you know me, I love the Spider-Verse, I love spider totems, but not all fans share my bizarre obsession with the Spider-Verse and Spider-Geddon stories and the villains known as the Inheritors. I swear, I'm like the only person that really loves the Inheritors. If you also love them, let me know in the comments. Show yourselves. With these stories came a pretty huge retcon which basically implied via learning about the great web and the spider totems placed within it that every spider, man or person had a kind of destiny to become that spider person. In other words, Peter Parker didn't have a freak accident, he was actually destined to become Spider-Man. It was fate! Many fans were not a fan of this change to his origins as they felt it detracted from what makes Peter Parker so appealing. That he's just an average kid who got a freak spider bite that gave him powers, as opposed to it being all ordained. Number three, Kang. Sometimes we talk about retcons that are ridiculous because they hurt the overall story. Other times there are retcons that feel like they don't really need to happen, and then there are those that just cause more confusion than really necessary. That's sort of the case with Kang. Kang the Conqueror was a villain who was first introduced in Avengers issue 8 in 1964. He is known for being a time traveling villain who enjoys sitting and floating around while menacing other people. As time went on, however, we'd come to discover due to the fact that he's a time traveler, the Kang was actually a bunch of other people, including Amortis and even Iron Lad. While these retcons were sometimes interesting, they don't really add much to his story, and at this point, Kang being revealed as just about anyone is so old hat, it's kind of lost its shock value as well. Now we're gonna get him in the MCU, I don't know what that's gonna be like. Could be weird, could be great. Number two, Aunt May's death. Remember when Aunt May died, but it wasn't really Aunt May, but an actress who had actually died while impersonating Aunt May? Yeah, that was a weird villainous plot. What we saw in the comics as an elderly Aunt May's death was later retconned into being one of the weirdest and most elaborate plots of Green Goblin's criminal career. It was later revealed that the woman who was dead and buried and who we thought had been Aunt May was actually an elderly actress who happened to be on her deathbed and who had agreed to take on one last role in order to torment Spider-Man? Prove how great of an actress she was? Her motives are pretty foggy. Maybe Green Goblin agreed to pay any surviving relatives of hers a ton of cash? I, I honestly don't know. What had really happened was this actress had been genetically altered to exactly match Aunt May's genes, meaning no one at the hospital suspected this imposter to be a fake. She died after revealing to Peter that she knew he was Spider-Man and was even buried in Aunt May's intended plot next to Uncle Ben for a time. That is, of course, until we all learned that Aunt May was really still alive and this had been some kind of bizarre ruse. Number 1. Clone Saga I won't deny that in my time on this channel I've come to actually somewhat love elements of the Clone Saga. I originally disliked Clone Saga when I started working here, but I very much have come to appreciate parts of the story and to acknowledge that without Clone Saga, you know, we wouldn't have some very awesome characters like Ben Riley and Kane Parker. However, one thing I still cannot get over is how long Marvel spent tricking everyone with this story. People spent 20 years thereabouts thinking they were reading Spider-Man as in Peter Parker only to find out that all those stories were not his but actually belonged to a clone. Granted at least it was a pretty cool clone who we'd all come to love after. But at the time this was a pretty shocking and frustrating revelation after years of stories and it left a lot of fans feeling betrayed at the time. Number 10, Made the Thing a Villain. Way back when in his classic villain days where many of Doctor Doom's plots were overly elaborate and therefore somewhat ridiculous, he created a time paradox when he forced the Fantastic Four to go back in time to retrieve Blackbeard's treasure. In so doing, he and the Fantastic Four team in essence created the dread Blackbeard, which it turned out was actually none other than Ben Grimm. In other words, Pirate Blackbeard would have never existed if not for Doctor Doom and the FF. So one, he not only created the legend of a rather cruel and vicious pirate, but he also made one of Marvel's biggest softies take on that role for Ben. 
Number 9. Doom Bots Dr. Doom has committed enough atrocious acts of justice himself, it's true. But then you also factor in all the deeds his Doom Bots have done as well. There have actually been many instances that we've thought Doom himself was responsible for various villainous acts, only to find out that we were fooled by Dr. Doom and that this was actually a Doom Bot disguised as him. There have also been many instances where we've thought Doom had died as well, only to find out that it was just a Doom Bot who had perished. Still, although passionate fans will be quick to point out instances in the comics where that Doom was actually a Doom Bot posing as the real deal, the truth remains that as the creator of Doom Bots, Doctor Doom is still technically responsible for all of their villainous and in some rare cases, good acts. Very rare that they're good. Number 8. Mind Control Dragon Tattoos In the Ultimate Universe of Earth 1610, Victor Von Doom's alternate counterpart, Victor Van Dame, ended up using dragon tattoos to mind control those who joined his micronation known as the Free Zone in Denmark. In reality, those who joined the rent free shanty town were not actually as free as they thought. In exchange for free living, those who joined Van Dame's Free Zone were asked to get dragon tattoos. Now, these tattoos allowed Van Dame to control the citizens as the micro microfibers in the tattoo interfaced with the wearer's brain. Number 7. Tortured the Fantastic Four family, including their son Franklin. And this is when he was just a little kid by the way. Poor little Franklin. Of course, Franklin Richards is a super powerful mutant in the world of the comics, but when faced with a horde of demons, it became frighteningly clear both how horrified he was and how innocent and vulnerable Franklin still was as a child. This experience left Franklin traumatized even after the Fantastic Four family managed to escape their fate. Doctor Doom sent Franklin to hell while torturing torturing every other member of the Fantastic Four, he forced the Thing to fight endless losing battles, set fire to Sue Richards, trapped Reed in a room filled with magic from which he could not escape, and gave the Human Torch Mr. Fantastic's powers and then proceeded to use those stretching powers to tie him into a knotted monstrosity. Number 6. Ugly equals evil. That's what Thanos' retcon taught us. Yep. Thanos' backstory was added in detail in the series Thanos Rising, and what many fans were surprised to learn was that his mother was apparently driven mad by her newborn baby's hideous appearance, and because of his appearance, claimed that she needed to kill him. That's pretty terrible. She sensed basically that because he was ugly, he would also be supremely evil. And the really shocking part of this was of course that she was right. But also, what the heck? Just because you don't like the look of your baby doesn't mean it should deserve to die. Fortunately, a retcon was later added to fix this when it was changed to it not being the baby's appearance but to a specific deviant gene in the child's genetic code that concerned both of his parents instead. Still, not great just analyzing your baby's genes and being like we already know you're going to be evil, but it's better than it just being about the ugliness in appearance as a pure reason for condemnation, I guess. Number 5. Doom is never wrong Some people like Doctor Doom a little too much. I'm probably guilty as being one of those people. To the point that they can't let him be flawed. Doom must be perfect. Well, while Doom may believe that, the reality is it's his flaws that actually help to make him such a great character, and also are important because they are a part of the reason for his villainous nature. Originally, his vendetta started against the Fantastic Four, and more specifically, Reed Richards, years ago. When Reed tried to give him pointers on a device he was building. Reed warned Doom that it was unstable, but Doom didn't listen. The device ended up exploding because, well, Richards had been right, scarring Doom's face. Unable to blame himself due to his huge ego, Doom decided to blame Reed, and thus a villain was born. However, retcons have come into play a few times in regards to his origins as to whose fault the device exploding really was. In one retcon, it's actually implied that it's Mephisto's fault, but if that's true, then why has Doom hated Reed so much for pretty much forever? Another retcon implied that Ben Grimm possibly intentionally sabotaged Doom's machine, which is an even worse retcon retcon because it makes Grimm, normally a very lovable character, look like a jerk. Both of these retcons help to buff out Doom's flaws at the expense of making his feuds illogical. Number 4. Peter and MJ's marriage never happened During the story One More Day, Peter made a pact with Mephisto to ensure that his Aunt May would live. Part of this deal was also that people would forget Peter's secret identity, which was currently out in the open. Although it wasn't like a bargain part of the deal, it was just a thing that would happen. But what did Mephisto want in return for this? Peter to never be a hero again? Did he want his soul? No. 
No, 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 no. He wanted his marriage? Mephisto wanted to take Peter's marriage to MJ. And by that, I don't mean that he wanted himself to marry MJ, which would actually make, in a weird turn of events, more sense. I mean, he wanted to make it so that their marriage never existed. This was such a strange request that many were left speechless when Peter agreed, and this actually happened. What was likely really going on is that Marvel no longer wanted Peter to be married or Joe Quesada never, never wanted Peter to get married in the first place. They wanted to return to the days when Peter was flying free and single, so this story happened to erase it. Number three, Norman Osborn and Gwen Stacy's relationship. This little frightening retcon was added during the Sins Past story. It also made Peter look like an insensitive jerk, just for good measure as well. The story here that was added in was that Gwen Stacy had an affair with Norman Osborn, a man who was much older than her at the time and who would go on to be responsible for her death. This affair resulted in Gwen becoming pregnant with twins, which she secretly gave birth to. Norman then raised these children, lying to them that they were actually the children of Spider Man and Gwen and that Spider-Man had killed their mother, turning them into misguided villains. This was not a retcon anyone needed, but hey, it was one that we got. Number two, Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver were never mutants. If you have been subscribers to our channel for a while, then you likely saw this one coming from a mile away. A list of the worst retcons with Amanda hosting it? Hmm, I wonder what she's gonna rank high up on that list. And you were right. One of the worst retcons in mutant history for me will always be this. During the events of Axis, it was revealed that Wanda Maximoff and her brother Pyotr, Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver, respectively, were never the children of Magneto. And as such, never mutants. Instead, we learned that the High Evolutionary abducted them when they were young, experimented on them, and then disguised them as mutants and returned them back to the world. Why? Well, we don't really know, which is part of the reason this is such a terrible retcon. That and it erased years of meaningful family drama and history and created a bunch of plot points that no longer really made any sense. Number one, Snap Wilson. Even worse than my own personal nerd rage towards the retcon of the Maximoff twins, everyone's outrage, my own included, against this retcon. I still can't believe this was a thing that even happened in the comics. Oh my goodness. Sam Wilson in the comics became a good friend of Captain America and was even known as his ally, the superhero Falcon. However, it was revealed that Sam Wilson wasn't actually Sam Wilson, a social worker from New York with falconry skills. This was all a fabrication of the Red Skull, who had had used the cosmic cube to turn him into the perfect partner for Captain America as part of an insidious plot. The true persona of Wilson was the criminal, thug, and pimp known as Snap Wilson. What? This would be revealed to Cap as being his true persona, which Cap would then save him from. Yikes. Fortunately, years later, we would see a retcon that would basically undo this one, turning the fake persona of Sam Wilson into the real persona for him, and the originally retconned real persona of Snap Wilson into the fake. Meaning that Sam Wilson was always Sam Wilson, and Snap Wilson was the version created and used by Red Skull. Whew! Thank goodness. Starting off at number 10, he destroyed Johannesburg. With many comic book stories to pick from, these events can get a little confusing. To start off the list, we go back now to the events of Avengers Age of Ultron, released back in 2015. Now, before Wanda Maximoff was an Avenger, she was getting some dirty work done to help Ultron. Okay, this included playing mind games with the Avengers. So Wanda gets to Banner and he hulks out big time. This time, it's very uncontrollable. Now, at this point in the MCU, the Hulk has a handle on his Hulk mode, kind of. Like, he's got it down. After Avengers 1, he was like, I'm always angry, and then he's like standing in the circle with them. He knows what he's doing to some degree, and with the help of Black Widow, she can tippity tap his palm and make him chill out. Black Widow was out of commission this time due to the same mind trick from Wanda, so he ends up going crazy in Johannesburg, and it takes Iron Man and his new Veronica hashtag Hulkbuster armor to come in and knock some sense into him, literally. Now, of course, Wanda was in his head, but none of the other Avengers reacted this way. They just went to places in their mind that brought them a lot of distraught, and they couldn't even fight anymore. They were leveled. So, the Hulk made matters worse, of course, resorting to punching and being, well, a monster. Number nine, he broke Las Vegas. The Hulk was assisting S.H.I.E.L.D. on a mission to clear out some Hydra weapons in the Vegas desert, and after a gamma bomb blew up in his face, he becomes this dark, menacing gray Hulk and begins to terrorize Vegas. The Fantastic Four's Thing comes to help, telling Johnny Storm that monsters understand monsters. Pretty valid point. 
So Ben goes up to Banner and lays it down. He explains that he knows he doesn't want to hurt anybody else, and that he's just messed up, that's all. He continues to offer to help Banner, treatment for the radiation gamma even. And then Hulk responds with, she's dead, Betty Banner is dead, and you can't do anything about it, you killed her. And then, bah, he goes crazy. So the people in Vegas see this monster battle happening on the news, and they love it? Yeah, they start placing bets. Some guy's like, eh, 50 bucks on the Hulk. Another guy's like, 50,000 bucks on the Hulk. It's wild. Check out Fantastic Four issue 533 for yourself to see how the Green Giant got through that. Number eight, he left the Avengers. Okay, again, we go back to Age of Ultron. So after the final battle on Sokovia, the Hulk decides to just leave. He hops in the Quinjet after tossing Ultron out and decides to just let it keep flying. He ended up going pretty far considering we don't see him at all during the Civil War storyline. It's not until Thor Ragnarok that we meet Banner again, and he has no idea where he is or how long he's been there. Without the help of Black Widow, he can't transform back into his regular nice Banner body. I have to include this because this is a decision the Hulk made, not Banner. There's a difference. He himself decided that he was just going to go. Maybe he was done with hurting people. It's actually a massive character arc that people didn't really look into enough. Like everybody came out of the theater like, whoa, Vision and Wanda, can't believe it. The Scepter was actually a, no way, dude. Hey guys, where's the Hulk? Why did, where did he go? That's the Hulk. Of course he came to the aid in Thor Ragnarok, but maybe if he hadn't gone at all, he wouldn't have fought Thanos when he did, huh? Therefore not losing and becoming unable to get mean and green come Infinity War when you really needed a Hulk. He could have figured it out on Earth. I mean, he figures out the perfect balance by Endgame, so I feel like if he just stuck around, he would have gotten to that point faster. Also, don't leave the Avengers, man. You need the science bros, always. Number seven. Madison Square Up Garden. This next one is pretty wild. So Thor Ragnarok was loosely based off of the Planet Hulk storyline. I say loosely because that story didn't end up going so well. Like the comic book story didn't end well. So on Sakaar, the rocket that he arrived in ended up blowing to smithereens, causing some casualties that left Hulk a little distraught. So what did he do? He heads back to Earth, pissed and thus begins the World War Hulk storyline. He just murks everybody, all the heroes that Earth has come to love, just in the path of this very angry beast. It's not a good situation. He locks the Illuminati in Madison Square Garden and then makes them fight to the death. I mean, once you spend enough time on Sakaar, I guess it becomes second nature to just battle it out. In the first issue of this series, you see Iron Man in his Hulkbuster armor, and he uses repulsors to accelerate his punch, which is something Iron Man can be seen doing in the MCU. I like when they keep small details like that that make these series memorable and awesome, especially the artwork. It looks really cool, and then they insert those into the MCU version of that story. See, even Hulk's design on Sakaar, they really wanted to treat the audience with the same elements that we loved already from the comic book. So make sure if you haven't already to grab all five issues of the 2007 World War Hulk storyline, because it's actually a treat, and you can plow through it in like a... Number six, his relationship with Scarlet Witch. This was just a weird and convoluted story in general, but basically Doctor Doom managed to wipe Wanda Maximoff's memories and then she fell in love with him and they were to be married. She didn't know who she was until Wiccan showed up and reminded her of her origin story and her family. Eventually Wanda put two and two together and figured out that Doom was manipulating her due to the fact that he seemed so concerned with her actually believing Wiccan's story. What's up with that Doom? Doom also claimed to be doing everything out of concern for protecting the world from Scarlet Witch's unpredictable and unstoppable reality warping powers. And for his real and true love of Wanda, he really loved her, so he claimed. However, he later revealed himself to be a man obsessed with only power when Wanda transferred her reality warping power of the life force to him, and he went all crazy. He also claimed to be responsible for the death of the Avengers and mass extinction of the mutants. He was like, that wasn't Wanda, that was me. Wait, what? <laughs> Number five, sacrificed his first love for sweet, sweet armor. Dr. Doom's inspiration for the name he gave his goddaughter, Sue and Reed Richards' little baby girl, Valeria, came from his first love, a love that later returned to his life and who he learned was the only woman he had ever really loved. So he claimed. When she did return, however, it was revealed that Dr. Doom had ulterior motives for his oldest and truest love. He didn't want to be with her, not in a traditional sense, anyways. He wanted to sacrifice her life and her soul in order to earn himself some powerful mystical armor. Readers watched as Valeria's skin burned away and her flesh was remade into Doom's shiny new armor. 
Number 4 Battle World Following the incursions, Doctor Doom was turned into God Emperor Doom when worlds collided and were destroyed, prompting Doom to use newly acquired reality warping powers and sort of reality mending powers to create his own universe. This universe would become known as Doom's Battle World, a patched together combination of the broken Marvel realities. Doom himself became a god to all the heroes and citizens who lived there. He had his own army of Thors at his disposal, making Doctor Strange his deputy and turning Sue Storm into his consort. When Reed Richards finally managed to return and find Doom, he made Doom confess that Richards would have actually built a better world and after fighting, Doom relinquished the power he'd used to Reed, who set out to actually remake the Marvelverse and most of its alternate realities once more, with only a few tweaks for improvements here and there. Number 3 Joie de Seigneur Well, some may praise Doctor Doom for being a great ruler who brought prosperity to Latveria, we also need to acknowledge that he also snatches many of his people's rights and freedoms away in being their governing monarch and ruler. This was showcased when Doctor Doom exercised his rights of Droit de Seigneur, marching into one of his faithful peasant Klaus's home on his wedding night and insisting that he be allowed to sleep with his bride Gretchen. Well, Klaus seems awkwardly accommodating, Gretchen appears down Downright shocked, upset, and possibly pissed off, and rightfully so. Also, yeah, Doctor Doom's Latveria still has a peasant class, so it isn't always depicted as being that great. Because if it was, why do you have peasants? What's up with that? Number 2 Dictatorship Dependency This is what Doctor Doom has created for Latveria, the nation he rules. While Latveria is considered a peaceful place with virtually no crime, nor problems of poverty or hunger harming its citizens who do genuinely seem to worship and love their ruler, Victor Von Doom, it's also a place that has become so dependent on his leadership that anytime he leaves, it basically breaks. Meaning that if there ever comes a time when Doom must leave permanently or finally dies for good, Latveria's economy will collapse and the nation will quickly devolve into chaos and ruin. We've seen what has happened to Latveria before in the comics when Doom has ceased being its ruler and it's truly never good for the nation. Number 1 Got Bored of Ruling the World Remember that time Victor Von Doom took control of the Purple Man aka Zebediah Kilgrave by trapping him in a psycho prism and used his focused powers by putting them in a gem which he used to control the world? Now you might think that sounds like the worst part of the story, Doom ruling the world, but in a strange twist, it actually wasn't. Using mind control of course is not really a heroic act, but in doing so Doctor Doom was able to create peace on earth. All wars ceased, no one went hungry, the global economy Economy prospered under his rule. However, with no one to challenge him, Doom became bored. So he abandoned ruling the world just as the heroes rushed in to stop him, freeing the world but in doing so also returning it to a state of disorder and chaos. Which may have been the real crime in this story. Just Doom being like, I don't want to rule anymore. And we're all like, but wait, you're, you're actually good at it. You had to use mind control, but still. Kicking off the list at number 10, making weapons. Now, of course, we see Tony Stark as the genius billionaire playboy philanthropist, but how exactly did Tony end up with all that cash money? Well, in the MCU, it is shown that Tony is running his father's company, of course, being Stark Industries. Founded in 1940 by, of course, Howard Stark, the company is the best at what it does, that being selling innovative weapons to the United States Armed Forces. Ooh, now after being kidnapped, by the Ten Rings and seen the damage that his weapons cause in an up close and very personal way, he of course seized all manufacturing of the weapons division. But the damage is done. It is later revealed in Avengers Age of Ultron that one of his Stark Industries manufactured missiles killed Wanda and Petro Maximoff's parents. Not cool, Stark. Not cool. Number 9. Hulk's Field Trip In the MCU, the Hulk leaves the Avengers and the planet for that matter. See, after tossing Ultron out of the Quinjet, the Hulk lets himself fly away on autopilot. Perhaps feeling that he's done too much damage and that his presence is causing more chaos than comfort. Well, in the comics, that basically happens, but it's done with haste. And it's done by none other than our very own Iron Man. So the Incredible Hulk issue 92, titled Planet Hulk, starts off with Reed Richards and Tony Stark talking to a monitor, and that monitor is sending footage to the Hulk in the ship. They explain to the Hulk their trick, which was to send the Hulk away while he was already in space for a previous mission with Fury. They say they've picked his destination very carefully, which is this lush planet full of vegetation and game. No intelligent life forms. Sounds pretty easy breezy for a creature like that, only, of course, he ends up on Sakaar, which is not that planet. It's very different. He's actually forced to become a 
gladiator and fight for his life. Now, the Hulk is out of the picture, right? Mission accomplished, we did it. Pew, gone, get that guy out of here. Wrong, Sakaar ends up being destroyed and the Hulk, well, he's got some names to scratch off his get even list. So he heads back to Earth to find the Illuminati and seek revenge, including on Tony Stark. Number eight, he faked his own death. Iron Man issue 284 has quite an interesting cover. It shows Tony Stark wearing a suit, but like a boring kind of suit. In a casket, ooh. And the text at the bottom of the page reads, the death of Anthony Stark. It shows all these superheroes mourning the loss of their friend and fellow Avenger. Even Doctor Doom is like, ah yes, let us drink to the memory of a worthy opponent. Like you know you're sick if Doctor Doom is like, yeah, cheers, I'll drink to you, that's cool. And to make things even crazier, he writes a note to Rhodey that says, this key card will give you full access to the entire complex. Take this CD-ROM disc to my office and play it on the AV system. Wow, nothing says futurist rich billionaire like, take this CD. It'll help you. Okay, you have to like wipe it off first, <gasps> put it in. So he puts it in and clicks play and it is pretty awesome. It shows Stark explaining that somebody has to carry on for him. The world needs an Iron Man. And bam, you see a suit made just for Rhodey. What a moment. Tony continues to say that Iron Man was the greatest thing that he's ever invented and he doesn't want it to die with him. Fair, I mean, it's pretty overwhelming for him though. I mean, all that responsibility of being the new Iron Man plus mourning your best friend, plus figuring out how to run a company, that's a lot of So finally, he suits up and it's epic. Iron Man lives again, but it turns out Tony wasn't actually dead at all, rather just under cryogenic stasis until a scientist sorted out his spinal software problems. Ha, Gotti. And number seven, he created Ultron. Ultron can't see the difference between saving the world and destroying it. Where do you think he gets that? That line is said by Wanda Maximoff in Avengers Age of Ultron. So Tony has created some amazing stuff. All of his suits, his innovative tech, barf, barf? That's the greatest thing. This dude knows what he's doing. But what if he created a supervillain? So we find Tony and Bruce working on Ultron, right? Or just the idea at this point, rather. See, Tony had this idea since Avengers 1 that if he could create a suit of armor around the world, it would be a safer place. Or rather, create a robot that kicks ass, essentially. Something that just takes care of threats while the Avengers, I don't know, read a book? Relax for once in their lives? Of course, one of the main elements helping them achieve this goal is the return of Loki's scepter. They think by studying the central power unit of the scepter, which ends up being the Mind Stone, one of the six Infinity Stones, they can finally solve this puzzle and be safe. Tony ends up accidentally infusing the consciousness from the Mind Stone into this evil, jealous killer bot that mirrors many aspects of Tony Stark. So Ultron immediately starts to learn about what he is and who the Avengers are, and with his brain being the super AI, he decides They've all just gotta go. And by the end of the movie, we have a horribly damaged Sokovia with roughly 177 deaths. One of those deaths being Charles Spencer, a young American engineer killed in the final fights. Charles's mother ends up confronting Stark in Captain America's Civil War, which ultimately leads to, drum roll, that. Number six, Old Man Logan. Now, we were all delighted to see an R-rated Wolverine story finally on the big screen with the release of Logan back in 2017. This was loosely based on the story Old Man Logan, written by Mark Miller and Steve McNiven. The film had Logan in the spotlight alongside Charles Xavier and Caliban, and is one of my favorite movies ever. Not even superhero movies, like just as a movie in general. Hugh Jackman is Chef's kiss, so good. But in the comics, the story has moments that are even darker than what we saw, believe it or not. Like how about um, a Hulk gang, for starters? That's right, so in this storyline, we find the Hulk as one of the few remaining superheroes on Earth. Now at this point, Banner had decided to breed with somebody like him. Maybe just a little bit too much like him. Like, I don't know, say, his cousin? Yeah, his cousin. So him and Jennifer Walters had an offspring and referred to them all as Hulk gang which is a sick nickname for your little ones. Now, if you think that's already twisted and wild, the Hulk gang actually killed Logan's family. Why? Well, they were bored, of course. What else do you do when you're bored? Do you watch these videos or do you just murder Wolverine's family? Today, you did the right choice. So, Wolverine went to exchange a few words with the man, of course, and Hulk ended up ooh, swallowing Wolverine whole. What a jerk. Don't worry though, Wolverine used his claws to get out in a rather messy way killing Papa Banner in the process. Number five, Statue of Liability. We go now to the Incredible Hulk issue 299. So after the Avengers and everybody decided, hey, the Hulk can finally control himself. Let's all be nice. Let's give him a statue. Reward the man. He earned it. 
Earth's Mightiest Hero. We love this guy. Yeah, he's on lunch boxes. So nice. Then in comes the villain Nightmare to ruin the day for the rest of us. So he taps into Banner's subconscious and makes him resort back to the monstrous, uncontrollable ways that he used to be. Again, kind of like when Wanda was messing with his brain in Age of Ultron. So he grabs a statue that was made for him and then just hucks it at Thor. That's hilarious. Like, hey, happy birthday. Thanks. Ugh. The Hulk even beats up Banner's girlfriend named Kate Waynesboro, not to be confused with the Waynes brothers. So next time you give your friend with anger problems a statue, just make sure they can't throw it at you. And number four, train problems. Have you ever been commuting to work and you think, oh, what's taking so damn long? Why isn't this train going anywhere? Well, in a world where these beasts exist in real life, the usual traffic jam would have most civilians palms sweating. Like if the Avengers were real today, like in our world, I'd be afraid all the time. So many villains, so many problems all the time. Like if I heard a balloon pop in the other room, I'd be like, huh, is it Loki? Are we good? Am I dust? What's going on? Uh, is it happening again, please? So in the Incredible Hulk 122, Hulk has a moment where he kind of ruins an entire locomotive, yeah. He was annoyed by the sound of a passing train and does his version of a rope workout. You know when those like guys get in the thing and they flick it? He does that but with a train track. Causes all the cars to fly in the air, like that tablecloth trick, except when your like, nephew does it and he doesn't know how to do it yet, so they all just fly off. No passengers were on the train, sure, but I mean, making it rain sidecars, I'm sure that's not the easiest thing to clean up. Number three, Joe not fix it. The Grey Hulk, AKA Joe fix it, is one of my favorite versions of the Hulk. He's like this bouncer in Vegas, and he reminds me of a security guard that I actually used to work with in a bar. His name's Tony, he was awesome. He was like this big, old guy, he's, he's amazing. So naturally, I like this Hulk a lot. The next point made me like him even more. He's a savage, a savage. So he sees his ex-girlfriend, Marlo Chandler, being attacked by a werewolf. So what does this giant, unstoppable monster do upon seeing this? He just stares and considers letting her get mauled. I mean, maybe he's jealous, maybe he's a little bit, eh, I don't know. But I mean, Joe Fixit is this tough, I don't give a shit kind of guy. I mean, come on, this is a pretty dark character arc. A little bit too much, Mr. Joe Fixit. And number two, kill the Tigra. Okay, yeah, this one goes pretty dark. We go now to the 1995 comic titled The Last Avengers Story. Now, at this point, most of our loved heroes have gotten old and retired. Either that or they've died in battle. Not much is happening in terms of super support. So, in the first issue, we find the Hulk in, of course, a fit of rage. Classic. And at one point, he gets his green mitts on Tigra and, oh baby, it's uh, that's a position you don't want to be involved in. Tigra jumps in like, yeah, we're a team, haha, -ha, the Hulk, I can just claw his eyes out as easily as anybody else. And then Banner grabs her and says, hey, make a wish, and pulls her apart. Like one of those holiday finger popper snapper things where you go, Yikes, make a wish. Who says that? This guy's messed. And finally, number one, Hungry Hungry Hulk. To end this list, I thought it was fair to pick the 2002 to 2004 run of The Ultimates, where Hulk is, of course, a cannibal. Mark Miller and Brian Hitch wrote this thing so well that I actually want to see this version on screen more than like any of the latter. So after becoming the Grey Hulk, he ended up eating a bunch of people. He even encounters Iron Man and says the line, little man smells like canned meat. Hulk want to know if he tastes like canned meat too. Like, if he he said that to me, I would my super suit. I would be like, no, I'm not dealing with this guy. You guys do it. Like, imagine if he said this in the movies, the entire theater would just sit up like, is he about to eat Tony Stank? So since the Grey Hulk incident, he's been locked up, rightfully so, but after Magneto attacks the Ultimate's base, they lose power for a little. So during that time, Hulk decides the six nursing staff members near him served as a tasty treat. And down the hatch they went. Yum yum. Number 10, rendered Eros powerless. It's got to be hard being the brother to Thanos. Just ask Eros, aka Star Fox about it, and I'm sure he'll tell you as much. Star Fox is often presented as being a hero in the comics, and yet despite his own reputation trying to do good at least, he has to live in Thanos' shadow. Of course, Eros has done some questionable things in the past as well, but I still can't help but feel a little bad for him. During the 1991 Infinity Gauntlet miniseries, while Thanos threatens Marvel's greatest heroes, Star Fox is taken prisoner by his brother who basically rendered him powerless and makes him watch as he torments his fellow superhero colleagues and friends, eventually killing many of them. Though of course, they would return. That is what it's like to be the brother to the Mad Titan though. He takes the phrase of sibling rivalry to a whole new level. Number 9. Kills his own servants. 
Thanos is not even above killing those who serve him. He has obviously without much remorse killed his own adopted daughter Gamora before in the comics and in the Marvel Cinematic Universe although it pained him, he also chose to sacrifice Gamora to get his way and complete his plan. The Black Order however are not usually people who betray Thanos, unlike his traitorous daughter. They are usually loyal to a fault, having been tested over the years by Thanos and chosen for their strength, ingenuity and ruthlessness. However, sometimes their own greed for power gets the best of them. Such was the case when Corvius Glaive ruled the Black Quadrant in Thanos' stead and was made to end his own life upon Thanos' return for basically doing so. He was like, I was just keeping the seat warm and Thanos was like, nah nah. I don't believe you, you're dead. Before there was the Black Order by the way, there was the Butcher Squadron as well, a team which Thanos assembled but would actually choose to murder members of at random for his own reasons. Not really a guy you want to serve I don't think. Number 8. Killed his father Mentor is known in the comics as Thanos' father. Alars, aka Mentor, has felt deep and intense guilt for years over his son's actions. At times, Mentor has even tried to intervene to try and fix the disaster and bloodshed that Thanos has wrought. In the end, Thanos grew sick and was dying from an unknown and seemingly uncurable disease. He turned to his brilliant father and accomplished scientist for a cure, after exhausting every other option he could think of. Mentor was forced to help Thanos when he threatened the other scientists lives and the lives of their families who resided on the moon where Alars was living. When pressed however, Mentor shared that a cure would take years to find if there even was one and that he was happy Thanos was finally dying, he only regretted not killing his son himself years ago. This outburst resulted in Thanos having an outburst of his own and he murdered his father in response. It's not a great relationship. Number 7. Killed his mother he just likes to kill everyone in his family pretty much. Granted his mother did try to kill him when he was born, so this feels almost somewhat poetic. In the series Thanos Rising we saw more into Thanos' origins and backstory as a youngster. Here we see him become more and more obsessed with death, specifically Lady Death, starting out with a weak stomach but growing to enjoy murdering animals, other children his age, and eventually killing his own mother, searching for something that would help him find who he was. Oddly enough, he thought killing his mother Suisan would make him somehow feel like or become less of a mom monster? As she had threatened him with a scalpel when he was just a baby, driven mad by his appearance, he also attacked her with one, tying her up and gagging her before cutting her open. Also what's with that sexy position that she's in when all of that's happening? That's weird. Number 6. Signing the Accords Captain America's Civil War was one of the most highly anticipated MCU movies, and it's pretty easy to figure out why. The two teams going against each other, I mean even the poster, I was sold. The movie touches base on incidents like Charles Spencer. How many people have died because of the Avengers? I mean sure the whole fun is seeing somebody like Stark create this powerful villain and then use his own wit to defeat him with the help of the Avengers, but like an asteroid basically hit Earth. I'm surprised more people didn't die in Sokovia to be honest. So the government sees this and makes every superhero sign these accords and Tony Stark is all on board. He wants this to happen. He's pushing it. That way the government can control what they do or where they go. So it's not their name that's on the line. And if you don't sign, you retire. That's the deal. Now of course some team members don't agree, like you know Captain America who's all about freedom. Tony basically forced team members to sign up and go against his very own co-worker Steve Rogers. It's wild because we see both these character arcs changed in this movie for the both of them. We see Cap at the start who wants to be this like team player and do everything by the books, you know in Captain America the first Avenger and now by his third movie he's an outlaw because Tony Stark didn't listen to him about Bucky. Now Stark when we first met him he was cocky. He was rich, he wanted to punch his way through all the problems, even spying on S.H.I.E.L.D. the second he entered the helicarrier. But now Tony wants everybody to sign and work for the government, all because he feels bad about creating Ultron and blowing it out of the sky. If he had never signed and listened to Cap, the crazy plan of Zemo's wouldn't have actually worked. The band would still be together and when Thanos came to Earth, they all would have smoked him before he even got hands of all the Infinity Stones. Ha! Rant over. Number 5. Hashtag Engaged 
Spider-Man Homecoming was released in 2017 and directed by John Watts. And it's amazing. I mean, this version of Spider-Man, this film version, this, this is Spider-Man. The older Tom Holland gets, the more and more this dude is gonna become Spider-Man. Like, he's gonna basically do what Robert Downey did with Iron Man. Like, it just works. This is it. We found the casting for this character. Done. Good luck to anybody else who wants to replace these guys. So one thing I hated about Spider-Man Homecoming was the very end of the movie. So Tony has this plan to introduce the world to Spider-Man, the newest Avenger, even showing him this fancy new iron spider suit as part of the pinch. Peter Parker, being all coy and smart, thinks that it's just a test and politely declines the offer. He says he would rather be a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man just to chill out, you know? So Tony reacts in a great way. He's all for it. He's like, yep, protect the little guys. I gotcha. And then after Peter walks away, we see Pepper Potts emerge from behind him, and in the background you can see all of these reporters and spectators. He really was planning on introducing a new Avenger. Also, after the events of Civil War, really? I always thought that was a weird time to be like, hey, remember on the news when this was a big deal? Well, here to introduce a high schooler with the ability to throw a bus, here's Spider-Man. He even comes with four metal arms and instant kill mode. Check it out, not a great plan, no. So instead of introducing the new Avenger, he has to do something. I mean, those poor reporters, how are they ever gonna get over it? So he grabs an engagement ring and last second, he proposes to Pepper Potts. Ah, damn, that's not a bad trick to have up your sleeve. Like, ah, oh, damn, I forgot my school project. Maybe I'll just propose to somebody in class instead. That'll distract them. Number four, address shout out. If there's somebody that wants to kill you, odds are you're just gonna stay away from that person, right? Like you don't just give your address out to the public, let alone, I don't know, a terrorist. So after Happy gets put in the hospital due to one of the Mandarin's attacks on the Chinese theater, Tony Stark decides he's got a few choice words for the man responsible, the Mandarin. Iron Man 3, of course, didn't go so well with fans given that the villain was just a fake out and a fake out that people were actually really looking forward to seeing. I mean, the Mandarin's one of the coolest villains ever. And instead we got not the Mandarin. We got like a guy who turns red. But in his message to the Mandarin after visiting Happy in the hospital, Tony says how he's not afraid of the Mandarin and he in fact should just die, pal. Do you ever argue with somebody and then you take it like a step too far and you're like, oh, I shouldn't have said that. So Tony gives his address to everybody filming. There's a news crew, there are people on their phones. Like, dude, I get you're upset, but come on, use your smart billionaire head. So of course he gets attacked by the Mandarin because he's the Mandarin and that's what villains do. They attack your Malibu mansions. What did you expect? And out of all of the suits Tony has access to, I'm talking his suit in the final battle for Avengers. He has the briefcase suit, the suitcase suit where he's like, you know, out of all these things, no, this guy gears up with a prototype suit. And of course he gets wrecked. That attack sets up the entire film. Could have easily been avoided if you just didn't give your address out on the news. Silly man. And number three, Superior Iron Man. So we go now to issue one of Superior Iron Man. The issue itself starts off mirroring the tech in Iron Man 3 in a way. Tony can control his suit and fight inside of it, but he's not actually in the suit. He's actually laying in a pool, sipping on margaritas. So his new Extremis armor was fascinating. So much so that Tony released it as like the smartphone app. Now this app allowed people to change their bodies using this virus, becoming however they wanted. And it was great, but then Tony does the ultimate power move and says that the app was actually just a free trial. And in order to continue using it, you have to pay 100 smackaroos a day. Honestly, that's not a bad deal. I would pay that to become Iron Man, definitely. I'd be broke. You know what I would do? I would actually pay for the app and then use the suit to rob banks and then use that money to pay for the app. I'm a villain. I guess I just realized I'm definitely a villain. Just said it out loud, there we go. Number two, bad armor. In the Age of X limited series released back in 2011, we find Tony Stark in a rather odd predicament. See, at this point in the series, issue two, I believe this happens, Tony is infected with this virus that is bonding him to his suit. You ever get like a piece of your sweater stuck to an arm hair and you're like, oh God, what's going on? And then you pull it and you're like, whew, that was close. It's kind of like that, except you know, way worse. He's even going by the name Steel Corpse, which, I mean, as far as names go, it's pretty good. It's pretty fitting. Now, at this point, he was a mutant killer. It's a long story, but basically when Iron Man went to stop killing these mutants, in like the turning point of the comic, his suit, which was now literally part of him, started to control him against his will. And it's super scary how it looks on the page. Like he looks so different and sick and gruesome. His body's not doing well at all handling the merge. So his armor starts to take aim at a group of mutants against his will and he freaks out, begging Captain America to save them in a rather 
dark way, if you know what I'm saying. So Cap then takes out Iron Man with a shot to the head. Nice move. A little late. I would have done it sooner in this uh, series, but definitely a good call. And finally for number one, Demon in a Bottle. So the classic storyline that was actually the center of attention for Iron Man 2 back in 2010. So in this movie we find Tony Stark and at this point the arc reactor in his chest was powered with a palladium core. So time plus usage of the Iron Man suit equals poison. Not great. So we see Tony's life being ran down to the ground. We see his mental health start to decline and at Tony's party he's hammered. He's peeing in a suit and then to see a drunk superhero like Tony Stark acting like that, it wasn't random. This idea didn't come out of nowhere. The idea was loosely based on the demon in a bottle storyline from the comics. See this character arc begins with Iron Man issue 120. We see Tony just slamming drinks. The opening shot we see like three mini bottles of gin and then Tony orders more. And the flight attendant's like, hey, how about a magazine? Because it's the middle of the day. And Tony responds with, nope, I'll do another martini. She even tries to cut him off. She tries to cut off Tony Stark. You know how fat that tip would have been? She says, sir, you've had like three already. Are you sure? And he's like, yes, ma'am, I am. Stating that he's drinking for two, the other, of course, being his Iron Man persona. That's a lovely sign right there. What happens when you have a superhero who loves slamming martinis? Well, you get Tony flying through the air drunk, spreading toxic fumes all over a crowd. The drunk tank himself even cheated on his girlfriend, Bethany. Not cool. The alcohol addiction was, of course, put to the side for the MCU storyline. Thank God. Like, imagine if Tony tried to snap his fingers, but he was too drunk. He's like, and I... I'm so hungry. Can we go home please? Like I gotta eat junior chickens right now. Number 10, lost his nose. After Wolverine lost his adamantium from Magneto ripping it out of him, which was also a pretty terrible thing he suffered through, he also lost his nose along with it. It seemed that without the adamantium, Wolverine then reverted to an animalistic state, which has been on and off characterized as some part of his mutation, or alternatively, he gets it from his biological father. During the time he was without his adamantium as such, he also started started to appear more animal-like, and as a result somehow lost his nose for some time in all the chaos of art that followed. Though thankfully, Logan would eventually get his nose and his adamantium returned him once again. Number 9. Possessed by the Black Blade The Black Blade was forged by a man named Muramasa himself, a legendary swordmaster who built the blade using a part of his soul. Known for being a madman, the fragment of his soul would live on and possess whosoever wielded it, making them also mad and in essence bloodthirsty. We saw this happen to Jessica Drew in the 1989 Wolverine series and then saw Wolverine manage to save Jessica when he himself took the blade from her. He thought this would kill her but instead the soul of Muramasa within the Black Blade merged with Wolverine's, seeing him as a kind of kindred spirit of sorts. Wolverine then found himself possessed and during this time almost killed Jessica Drew and the Silver Samurai as a result. Fortunately, he managed to assert his own will and reject the Black Blade's influence in the end, but being possessed is of course never fun. Although I don't think he would have been too beat up if he had ended up killing the Silver Samurai while possessed. Number 8. His Wolf Family Getting Murdered Wolverine has more origins than I have fingers. One such origin tale for him allows us to see him living with wolves, retreating to the wilderness after suffering a great trauma. The pack he lives with has become his family, and he takes great pride in taking care of his family and their newest cubs. However, Wolverine's curiosity one day gets the better of him when he and his pack run into the White Bear, a mysterious and uncommon sight for them. Wolverine senses the bear is out of place and tries to help it by leaving it gifts of food. Unfortunately, he seems to be unable to help it, until the bear one day manages to follow the scent of Wolverine's pack, tracking them down and slaughtering them. Wolverine returns home to find his family killed and devoured by the bear. With a mix of emotion, Logan himself strikes out and kills the bear, falling himself but recovering after a short while. Poor Wolverine can't even have a wolf family in the comics without some tragedy coming along and ruining it. Number 7. Forgot who he was. The amount of times that Wolverine has had his memories blocked, altered, and experienced amnesia is numerous. If you go back to some of his early years in the comic, he even seems to be somewhat lost in terms of really knowing who he is or why he is the way he is. In Claremont's Wolverine run from 1989, Wolverine even seems to have very little idea of what his early life was like. At this point, he even seems to believe that his claws are completely made of adamantium and that they were even implanted inside him and are not actually part of his mutant powers. But he doesn't seem to recall who implanted these claws or why. 
Later on, we learned that Weapon X was responsible for the adamantium that was fused and coating his skeleton, and that his claws underneath were actually made of bone. We'd also learned that these bone claws were part of his mutation, and not created in some lab like he'd originally believed. Due to the amount of times his brain has been tampered with and his unique healing factor, Wolverine on a regular basis seems to forget various things about his past. His mind is constantly foggy when it comes to what he has done and even sometimes who he is. Number 6. Child Killer you wouldn't think that Thanos would make a great father, and he doesn't really. <laughs> but that hasn't stopped him from siring many children throughout the galaxy and adopting others at times. Gamora is his adoptive daughter, but he also has a naturally born son named Thane. In fact, Thanos even attempted to find his son at one point during Infinity. He didn't want to find him to reconnect though, or repair a lost or severed connection. He wanted to find his son in order to kill him. Not knowing where to look, he decided the best course of action was to kill as many children within Thane's possible age group as possible. Thanos disguised this plot as one of conquest, ordering planets to pledge fealty to him and offer a tribute of the heads of their youths between the ages of 16 to 22. Number 5. Influences Thane this doesn't sound so bad as a title for a point, until you realize just what that influence did. Thane was Thanos' son, whose mother had been an inhuman. Before Thanos showed up, Thane was a healer and didn't know that he was Thanos' son. Thanos, in his hunt to eliminate the child, demanded the heads of Attilans and therefore the Inhumans' children. This ended with a fight where Thanos fought Black Bolt and Black Bolt detonated a Terrigen bomb. The bomb was so massive it triggered Terrigenesis in all those who had an Inhuman lineage on the planet Earth's surface, including, you guessed it, Thane. Thane's power was death, and he instantly went from trying to save people so basically killing everyone around him in an instant. Pardon my snapping. Completely unaware of what was happening. He later learned of his legacy and Thanos promised he would kill him. However, Ebony Maw betrayed his master and instead set Thane free and influenced him to accept his destiny and fight his father. Thane did this and won, trapping Thanos. Learning of his heritage and with the influence of the evil Ebony Maw, who was only there due to the fact that he was originally a member of Thanos' Black Order and was originally loyal to him. Thane became a deadly and dangerous villain over time, with power initially rivaling his father's. Number 4. Mass Extermination Policy We all know Thanos as someone who is heartless, ruthless, and who kills to get closer to his one true love, Lady Death. And yet there is another reason he sometimes is known as a mass exterminator when it comes to various species and alien worlds. In the 2019 Thanos series, we see him going up against one of his greatest foes, Magus. And we see how he attempts to prevent Magus from expanding his universal Church of Truth, a much more evil religion than it sounds, let me tell you. By killing Killing everyone in order to prevent Magus from ever being able to convert them. You can't convert people if they're dead. Well, really joining Magus's church also is not an ideal scenario anyways. Killing them to prevent this is intense and cruel. In truth, Thanos has always enjoyed killing, so to him it's likely like hitting three birds with one stone. He not only gets to rob Magus of converts, but also gets to revel in death, and also gets closer to Lady Death through killing. Yay! Number 3. Brought Peace to the World If you don't know Cosmic Ghost Rider, here's the abbreviated version of his backstory. He's basically a superpowered Frank Castle from an alternate world where Thanos killed everyone. He is the power cosmic and is also a spirit of vengeance and a ghost rider, likely the last one. He's also been around so long and alone for so long that he's pretty mentally unstable. He was one of the last to stand against Thanos, but eventually ended up joining him because there wasn't really anyone else left to fight alongside, and he realized he couldn't beat Thanos at the end of the day. Cosmic Ghost Rider first appeared in 2016's Thanos series, and would get a few miniseries of his own thereafter. His self-titled series shows him stealing baby Thanos so that he might raise him to be better, thereby preventing all the death and destruction we've come to know Thanos for. But even with Cosmic Ghost Rider's insane but well-meaning influence, we learn Thanos cannot be fixed. At first, CGR thinks he succeeded, but he later learns when he runs into Thanos from the future that his Punisher Thanos of a son has somehow grown up to be an even worse tyrant 
than without his influence, proving that even when people try to raise Thanos right and try to prevent him from becoming some crazy tyrant, it will still always end badly. Thanos forcefully brought peace to the world and when others resisted his rule, he killed those who opposed him and created internment camps to keep the rebels in. Number 2. Sacrifices Millions for the Love of a Lady In the comics, Thanos merely wielded the Infinity Gauntlet and snapped those out of existence to simply get closer to Lady Death, who he was wooing. That's right, in the comics the snap was simply an attempt to impress his eternal crush. Killing billions just for a chance at love with someone? A chance? That's pretty terrible if you ask me. Number 1. Killed Death if this feels like a paradox, well, it kind of is. But we need to remember in the Marvel Universe, for Thanos anyways, death is not just a concept, but is also a person, Lady Death, his love. In an alternate universe, however, Death and Thanos have a different relationship, less of an unrequited love story, as Death is posing as Thanos' mother. Until Thanos realizes that Death actually has been lying to him and takes revenge on her by killing her. This doesn't sound so terrible until you realize the ramification of this action as Thanos does in the story. Basically, killing death messes with the whole balance of the universe and everything, which as we've seen in other alternate worlds like the Cancerverse, can be very, very bad. Of course, this doesn't go as terribly as the Cancerverse, as this happens in Earth X, an alternate world known as Earth 9997, and we at least don't have the influence of the many angled ones in this alternate world to worry about. Number 10. Runes Xmas. Likely for a lifetime for one unfortunate child, Punisher is disguised as Santa and posing as a man looking to raise funds for charity. When he asks the passing Napolitano family to help the poor, they refuse. He reveals himself and then guns them down, right in front of a child. Horrified, the child asks why, and Frank answers, they were naughty. Wow. Well, that kid will fortunately never misbehave again, but it will probably also take years of therapy to undo the damage that the Punisher also just did to his mental health. He's gonna be terrified of Santa for forever. Number 9. Murders Litterbugs Although the story was later retconned somewhat in an effort to explain away the Punisher's intense and erratic behavior here, when it was first released, this behavior was considered canon. Punisher had recently returned to the streets, condemning them and their inhabitants as being worse than ever. He was out to punish those who caused any harm to others or society in general, which meant zero tolerance for litterbugs. At one point, we watch as he guns down a couple in the rain who discard a soggy newspaper on to the ground they've been using as a makeshift umbrella. Aren't newspapers compostable, Frank? I mean, I guess they take a long time to decompose, so it's still not amazing for the environment, but still. Professing in his internal monologue that littering is a crime, the Punisher fires at the couple, and we see at least one of them topple over in the corner of a panel. Their fate isn't confirmed, but it's definitely heavily implied here that he just killed them for littering. Number 8. Torture Research Garth Ennis' Punisher story, The Slavers, is widely recognized for being one of the darkest ones out there. While the Punisher seems justified in taking on some of the worst and most horrible people that he's ever gone up against, and you definitely root for him, he also goes to great lengths to deal out his own form of justice here. At one point, we see Castle going through medical textbooks just so he can increase his knowledge for enhanced torturing purposes. There are countless violent moments in the story that both feel justified and also make you wins as you see just how far the Punisher is willing to go to punish these people. It should also be noted that this is a mission of vengeance that Frank is actually undertaking not even for himself, but for someone who escaped these villains, a woman named Viroka, and for her baby whom her captors had killed. Number 7. Torturing Barracuda So, Barracuda is admittedly a villain in the comics, but still, the way Punisher disposes of villains can sometimes just be so graphic and awful that it leaves you sympathizing with them. That was the kind of fate Barracuda was resigned to, a villain introduced during Garth Ennis' time writing The Punisher in the 2004 Punisher series, which was part of the Max label at Marvel. This Punisher, by the way, is also resigned to another alternate world as well, and honestly, a lot of his actions were pretty horrific. So yeah, this is not Earth-616 my friends. This is Max, adult comic stuff. When it came to Barracuda, Castle punished him by connecting some sensitive parts to a car battery and shocking the heck out of him. Later on, he would try to kill Barracuda in an explosion, but only severely burn him. Then he would chop off both his arms and bury a pickaxe in his chest before shooting his head to bits with an AK-47. It's pretty awful, I gotta say. Number 6. 
entire family was murdered in the old man Logan story. Logan actually manages to settle down and start a family with a woman named Maureen in the apocalypse. Together they have two children, Jade and Scotty, likely named after Logan's old friend and sometimes rival, Cyclops aka Scott Summers. Unfortunately, when Logan is forced to go on a mission to earn rent sooner and in a higher sum than expected by the Hulk gang, he returns on time, in fact earlier than that, only to find that the Hulk gang got bored and murdered his entire family anyways. His two kids and Maureen are all dead. Logan gets his revenge of course, tragically though, it does nothing to bring back that which he has lost. Number 5. Forced to kill Jean Grey multiple times too. Of course, Wolverine usually only kills Jeannie to spare her pain, but he also has a tendency to stab her and others that he cares for right through the gut. So not sure how much pain he's really sparing her there. In fact, I feel like, you know, as someone who wields a sword, if you really want to hurt them, you usually stab them to the gut. Just saying. Wolverine has been asked to kill Jean multiple times. One time, he was asked to kill her an innumerable amount of times all in one go, when she believed her deaths would weaken the Phoenix Force and so asked Logan to kill her on repeat for goodness knows how long. Of course, as we've seen in the newest Wolverine series, when once again Logan kills Jean, this time not on purpose, it hurts Wolverine to have to do this. He doesn't like to hurt the ones he loves, yet he often feels as though this is a cycle that will never end, which is also why he tends to keep to himself more often than not, because he doesn't want to risk hurting those who get close to him. Aww. Number 4. Sent to Hell The Red Right Hand and Mystique were the ones responsible for this plot. Mystique lured Wolverine into a ritualistic circle where his soul was then sent to hell. Wolverine's soul was not only tormented, but his body actually became the host for a demon, being known as Helverine on Earth, an entity who sought to destroy everyone Logan had ever cared about. In Hell, Logan had to face the ghosts of his past. Mariko, who was herself in Hell, was even ordered and forced into torturing Logan. She ended up in Hell due to the fact that she was the head of the criminal Yoshida family. Yikes. Number 3. Forced to kill Dokken While Dokken has definitely earned his father's ire, the truth is Wolverine has never wanted to kill his son. Not really. Despite the fact that Dokken has attempted to kill and has effectively tortured Wolverine for years in the comics, Wolverine struggled to accept the fact that he had to end Dokken's life when the time came. Later on, it was revealed that although it had been Wolverine's choice to kill Dokken, drowning him in a puddle, which actually ended up being a much more emotional moment in the comics than it sounds, it had actually all been part of Sabretooth's plot to torment his nemesis, Wolverine. Sabretooth had manipulated Dokken knowing that Wolverine would be forced to kill him. Number 2. Murdering his kids. If you think killing Dawkins was bad, keep in mind that it wasn't as bad as this next point. Wolverine was manipulated into facing and killing his own children by his own son Dawkins himself. Dawkins had been working with the Red Right Hand, an organization focused on destroying Wolverine's life due to their common hatred of the hero. Dawkins, working in collaboration, brought a team known as the Mongrels together, which was comprised of Wolverine's as yet unknown children. They would remain unknown too, as Wolverine was forced to kill them when the Mongrels attacked him and refused to stand down. It was only after they were all dead that it was revealed to him that the team was entirely made up of his own flesh and blood. His own kids! Shocked and traumatized at this discovery, Logan knew he could never make amends but took it upon himself to at least give them a decent burial. Number 1. Manipulated into murdering all of the X-Men In the alternate future belonging to the Old Man Logan universe of Earth 807128, Wolverine has seen and experienced some of the worst things ever. This alternate version of Logan no longer goes by the name Wolverine in that future. That's because he was the one responsible for murdering the entire X-Men team, and all the students residing at the X-Mansion. But it wasn't his fault. Wolverine at the time was manipulated into doing so by Mysterio, who created an illusion that made Wolverine see everyone in the mansion as a villain and an intruder. The illusion faded away only after Logan had killed everyone, with it being revealed that his last opponent, whom he thought was Bullseye, had really been one of his, had really been one of his closest allies, Mutant Jubilee. Sad. Thank you.